What Tony mentioned was that when her first child was diagnosed with diabetes, no one else in her family had the disease. It seemed to come out of the blue. But then, yet another person within her family was afflicted with diabetes. Now, unfortunately, that's exactly what we'd expect. Because we know that of 300 people who have no family history of type 1 diabetes, one will eventually get the disease. In contrast, if we had 300 people who already had a family member with diabetes, 15 people will turn up to have the disease. That's a 15 times increased risk. And so unfortunately, what occurred in your family is not uncommon. And it was actually more than 30 years ago. <laughs> it's scary to realize. But, but Jerry was one of the first people that really made that connection, a certain types of genes that were associated not only with type 1 diabetes, but other autoimmune diseases. Here are the HLA genes. Now, of course, 30 years ago, there was the Type 1 Diabetes Genetics Consortium. This was an NIH-funded international effort where samples were taken from people in Australia and Asia, in Europe, and in North America. And they turned to us at BRI to say, we'd like you to get those samples and make this happen to provide samples for people who are studying the new genes in diabetes. And they wanted us particularly to find families like the Bergs who had two or more people affected with type 1 diabetes. And as Jerry indicated, the NIH turned to us to do this successful program. But knowing just what the genes are doesn't tell you more than that's what the genes are. Really, what we need to understand is what is it that the genes do. And here again, as Jerry already introduced, BRI has had a major role. So if we look at what is the role of genetics, Bill Kwok at the BRI did exactly what Jerry mentioned earlier. He used the information about these genes to be able to devise a tool to select those particular immune cells that are causing autoimmune disease. Subsequently, with the information that we got from the Genetics Consortium about the other genes that have a little bit less um, dramatic risk, we still wanted to address the question of what does those genes do that's affecting the immune system? And here, Jane Buckner, Karen Sarusalati, and others at BRI were really taking the leadership role in understanding those connections. Now, why was she able to do this? Because we have a registry and a repository. That is, we have samples from people who have autoimmune diseases like diabetes, MS, et cetera, and their family members, and we have those stored along with data about people. So when Dr. Buckner, Sarusalati, Dr. Long wanted to study this, they went to our freezers and they said, here's somebody with a, this kind of gene. I can test and find out how that gene affects that immune response. And really able to make major leaps in that way. More importantly, as I mentioned, we don't have those just in diabetes. We have samples across autoimmune diseases. So uniquely, she was able to look to see how these are interconnected in other autoimmune diseases. Now, Jerry also mentioned that others started paying attention. They said, hey, BRI's got this set up so people can actually study what's going on in human diseases. And so then they started reaching out in other ways. So much of that work had originally been funded by the JDRF. But there was another player on the block. So the Helmsley Trust. All of you might think she gave all the money to the dog, but that's not true. <laughs> In fact, the Helmsley Trust is a major funder of type 1 diabetes research. But different than the NIH or the JDRF, you don't go and apply to them, they find you. So they came to us because what they had established already is the type 1 diabetes exchange, where more than 70 clinics in North America are joining together, as well as an online patient community. But they felt they were missing a third component. That third component was how to advance the science, connecting the patients to the science. And they knew what we had done. And they came to us and they said, hey, BRI, Carla, we want you in charge of the type 1 um, exchange biobank so that you can provide these samples not just to BRI investigators, but to people all over the world to be able to do that. And Jerry mentioned another recent development was our appointment here as the coordinating center for the JDRF Biomarker Workshop, international workshop, but somebody needed to coordinate that effort and to look at these tests and repeatedly to make sure someday they'll be able to be used in clinical studies and trials that we do. So that was a long-winded story around Tony's real story, because really it was Tony and families like hers that really provide the samples that allow these advances to take place. <laughs>